This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African drums are sounding. Good evening. Welcome to this week's edition of African Drums, the television organ of the Coffee 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self activity. I am Elsie Harry, and I'll be your host for this evening's program. As we continue our series on African Guyanese political leaders who have distinguished themselves on the national stage, we turn our attention to one who is still alive and who was on the show just a few months ago, UC Quayana. UC Quayana, formerly known as Sydney King, was a member of the leadership of the original PPP, a cabinet member in the first self-government and an active participant in the village movement of that period. He would go on to play a pivotal role in Guyana's politics for the next six decades. Of particular interest to this show is his larger-than-life role in the African cultural life in Guyana. As leader of the African Society for Cultural Relations with Independent Africa, ASCRIA, his name became synonymous with black nationalism and pan-Africanism in Guyana during the 1960s and beyond. Here to help us put Quayana, or Brother Yusi as he's fondly referred to in perspective, is Miss Estherine Adams, who is a history lecturer at the University of Guyana and a Quayana expert. Mr. Takuma Ogunse, executive member of the WPA to which Brother UC belongs. Takuma may be described as a Quayanite, having served with Quayana for years in Ascria and the WPA. Estherine, Takuma, welcome to African Drums. Thank Pleasure you. to be here. You're welcome. Okay, let us start with my usual broad question when we have one of these series. Why in 2015 should we should we be having a conversation about UC Quayana? And since you are a Quayanite, we'll start with you, Tiguma. Um, it's a pleasure to join um, you younger generation Guyanese to discuss um, Brother UC's Quayana. I think that every society has a duty to take cognizance of its outstanding personalities and especially persons who have made significant contributions to society and country. I think that Brother UC Kwayana has made a tremendous contribution to the country, and I think that in itself um, warrant you know, um, examination and discussion. More important, or equally important, I think he has been a, a very unique political person you know, a very uncorruptible person, a person who have defied the so-called political norm. And I think that in itself also warrant some amount of examination in an era when we are just mo hopefully moving out of a very, you know, nasty and corrupt political um, period in the country's history. Okay. Esther, um, thank you, Elsie. And I would never consider myself an expert on UC Quayana. I don't think anybody could be an expert on UC Quayana. Um, but why in why we should still be having a conversation about Quayana? Because Quayana is still relevant. What he stood for is still relevant, right? Um, the contributions that he has made to the political developments in Guyana today is still relevant in 20, in 2015, all right? So focusing on what we know. And if we can use some of that to develop what we have, it can make a tremendous difference in the, po um, in the political life of Guyanese. Okay. Let's get into a discussion of where does Quayana fit in the architecture of Guyana's political leadership. We've had Burnham, Jagan, Rodney, Hoyt, 
each carving out their own place. Where does Quayana fit and what makes him unique in that group of individuals? If I may go first, I sure. think that um, one of the things that make him so unique is that he is a completely self-taught, homegrown political activist. You see, the Burnhams and the Jagans and the Rodneys and all of them, if you look at their political development, you will notice that they spent a lot of time overseas at universities and things like that. But you wouldn't see that with Quayano. What he has learned, how he has um, developed as a political activist is completely homegrown. It is what he did on the ground, so to speak, all right? The grassroots movement that he was a part of. And that is something that you will find that is quite unique to him, all right? And in addition to that, Koyana has spent more than half of his life fighting for equality in Guyana, fighting for freedom and it's it's really a selfless struggle that he has been a part of for such a long period of time so i think that in itself makes him a unique individual in this whole political arena okay I, I i want to endorse everything that she said because i think she put it very beautifully yes. um i think Quayano brings to, to political life a element of unselfish service mm -hmm. You see, and he is a person throughout his political life. He really um, had great difficulty with assuming political power at a, in a personal sense. He understood and he supported the, the, the fight for political power for the movement, for the country. But as an individual, express, you know, for that power to be vested in him as an individual, he, he always had difficulties in it. To the extent that he, mm -hmm. he he served in the government is because he felt you know he had to respond respect the, the, the you know the, the, the aspirations of ordinary people, but he really struggled to make sure that you know politics becomes something to empower community and masses rather than to empower individuals. Yes. And I think that makes him very unique politically. And I think that's something that our politicians in today's age can borrow More. from. Definitely, Quayana. yes. Okay, Esterine, you did your MA thesis on Quayana. Talk to us about his role in the early PPP. All right, um, Quayana actually met Dr. Jagan in 1947, and that was when Jagan was preparing for his bid um, for the Legislative Council. And Quayana himself said that before that he was never really interested in politics or anything of the sort because he saw politicians as these big people that took advantage of the masses. All right? They didn't really um, invest in the people as they, as they should have. All right? But what he saw in Jagan's um, presentation one evening was, a, as he termed it, a moral element in politics. Mm -hmm. something that was not there before and he said something that stuck with him was um, Jagan's ca um, call to the workers and he was saying something like workers of the world unite you have nothing but your chains to lose which is actually the clarion call of the um, of the communist manifesto and um, with that something resonated with within him and he found something he could identify with Right, a political movement that he could identify with. Now, um, even though he wasn't a founding member of the PAC, he joined the, PN the PAC, he had discussions group, um, discussion groups in, in Buxton, and he was very much involved in what was going on in the PAC. Of course, we know that eventually the PAC uh, morphed into the PPP, the, what we term the original PPP and so he was actually a founding member of the of the PPP and what he brought to the PPP was his personal prestige because he was quite well known on the on the East Coast all right um, he brought his reputation because by then he had some sort of a reputation in the villages good of course and he brought his experience as an as a grassroots organizer to the PPP because by then he was somewhat involved in local politics in Buxton his 
home village and he was able to bring what he had acquired there over into the PPP. Um, in that in the PPP, he fought alongside all the stalwarts for constitutional reforms. He made several visits overseas to countries that we would consider now at that time to have been behind the Iron Curtain, like Austria and Hungary and the Czech Republic and those places. And what he those visits, what they were supposed to do or what they did for him was to give him that knowledge to assist him in the fight for equality and equal rights for the poor and the powerless in British Guyana. In 1953, he stood for the Central Demerara constituency and he won 73% of the total votes. As we know, the PBB won those elections hands down and he was given the portfolio of Minister of Communication and Works. And quite early in the um, in this new government, you, you saw the strain and the struggle among the leaders. What is what we term crisis week, the week when they were trying to determine who was going to be which minister for what portfolio. And the week when um, it is said that Burnham actually made a bid for the leadership of the Legislative Council. And you see Kwayana stepping up there as sort of a mediator. We can look at it that way and trying to bring some sort of settlement into that pro um, the problem with the two sides in the party. It is said that Martin Carter actually suggested that Kwayana be appointed leader of the party just to, you know, bring some sort of settlement between Burnham and um, the, Jagan the Jagonite faction. But Kwayana refused, all right? He refused such a, such a, um, a position and he, to him, it was a matter of principle. Jagan was there and he was working for the for the um, the formation of this party from the from the first day. And so Kwana didn't feel that it was right that you should come in as an outsider and just take take over the um, the position as, as the as the leader. And if you look at that, you know, how many of us given that opportunity would actually turn something like that down? And that just goes to show how principal a person he was, or sorry, he is because he's still with us. <laughs> yes. All right. But it just goes to show how principal a person he is because he refused such a position. I mean, we would have made excuses. Well, yes, this is probably the best thing for the party. Everybody agrees because Burnham actually agreed that, you know, Kwayana should be given the, the position rather than him or, or, um, or Jagan. And so we see from an early, an early stage in his um, political development, he was always... A man of principle and is something that he would that you will continue to see throughout his political life now as we know that um, in October of 1953 the British government suspended the Constitution and basically put the PVP government out of office and Kwayana was jailed under the emergency regulations he was um, charged quite frivolous charges, distributing handbills and, st and um, fomenting strikes and all sorts of things. All right. So um, he spent some time in, in jail. Um, he, he, in January of 1954, he was released from prison and he spent the next couple of years with the PBB. He, in the first split of the PBB in 1954, he remained with Jagan, that's when the um, Jagannite faction and the Burnhamite faction would um, emerge of the PBB, and Kwayana remained with Jagan because he felt that the that Jagan's group was in a better position to bring Guyana out of the problems that it was in politically at the time. All right, so for him, it wasn't a matter of race because uh, Burnham being of African ancestry and Jagan of Indian ancestry, that he would automatically go with Burnham because Burnham was black. And all right, for him, it wasn't a matter of race. Again, we see his principles. It was a matter of principle for him. He felt that this group was more equipped to deal with the problems of the country. And so that being the best um, position for him, he remained with Jagan. All right. I mean, there are several other reasons why he remained, but generally because he believed that the Jagannite faction was in a better position to deal with the situations that um, Gyan had found herself in. But then in 19... 
56, you, we will see that he, along with Cartel and Westmos and a couple of others, eventually would leave the PPP because according to him, he became disappointed with Jagan's position and some of these positions he considered to be racial. All right, and a lot of it stemmed from the 1956 Congress speech that Jagan had given, and he felt that the the um, African faction of the party was being blamed for a lot of the problems that the party had found itself in, and he took it quite personally. And he, along with Martin Carter, Rory Westmus, and the others, they eventually left the party because he couldn't reconcile that Jagan with the Jagan that he knew, the person that had brought him in, the person that had nurtured him um, in the early stages, brought him to the point that he was in. He couldn't understand why he would take such a position and he felt that, you know, a lot of the um, influences in the party had been shifted. So that basically sums up his early um, years in the PVP. Okay, so during your response you mentioned that he would go with the Jagan faction and then later he would end up with the Burnham faction but in 1971 he would break from Burnham and team up with Rodney and other younger members of the WPA. What does this tell us about Quayana's praxis and Takuma you can Okay um let me go back a little to fill some gaps. Sure. Yeah, because there's something about Quayana's um, activism is not so well in the historical documents. Mm -hmm. um, when the PPP were preparing to contest the, the, the first major elections as a party, Koyano was very conscious that the party itself was not as developed as it ought to be. He was also conscious about the racial tensions that was, you know, despite the show of unity, there were yeah. racial mm -hmm. tensions on the grounds and so on. And he suggested to the party that, look, we should not go to win the government. Mm -hmm. We should go to win enough seats to make us a very effective opposition. Mm -hmm. And it will give us a, the next few years to strengthen the party and to deal with some of the undercurrents, both in the society and in the party. Of course, the other major leaders didn't buy into that. And they, Koyana had no doubts about the fact that the party would win the elections. And they went to the elections and they won it, but we know what ha what happened. Mm -hmm. I think that is worth um, putting into, you know, into the historical records in a more prominent way. Um, in terms of the split with um, Dr. Jagon, one of the, 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 the decisive issues of Koyano was the question, you know, the PPP have always supported federation, you know, it was the, the mm -hmm. Caribbean unity and and. Mm -hmm. and and to push Guyana in the federation, and they always felt that Guyana as a, you know, the PVP and Guyana as a progressive force would be an important influence in uniting the Caribbean. Um, there were Indian elements in the country and the party who were arguing against federation mm -hmm. because they saw that the Indians in Guyana, as a, in terms of numbers, have an automatic number advantage, which they felt they would lose in a wider Caribbean. And uh, they were very active. And in Chedi's speech in the Congress, he he took the position of the Indian um, racist elements, and he and he, he argued, you know, a formulation that put the Indian business, the, the reactionary Indian elements, in some progressive, you know, um, construct. And he used that to argue that Ghana shouldn't be part of the federation. Mm -hmm. I think that is where a uh, UC, you know, couldn't take it anymore because he saw very clearly that Jagon was, you know, going back on everything that he stood for over the years, you know. So that, that was a very important um, 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 factor in, 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 the, in, in the split. Um, in terms of, okay, let, uh, let us fast forward to the 70s. Now, Askria, before we get to the 70s, you see, one of the problems the PNC and Burnham always had in the election equation, Burnham was very popular in the city. Somehow, Chedi had, even among the rural Africans, 
have captured the imagination of even rural Africans. You know, they could follow his his language, his speech is better boredom was very, you know, eloquent, <laughs> you know, Anglo Saxon, <laughs> you know, language. And it had a disconnect. And the PNC had some problems of, 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 of uniting the African rural community behind them, which put them, you know, in a weak electoral position, you know, against a, a united PPP. And um, Askria, when Askria played a tremendous role in bringing the rural Africans, mm -hmm. you know, under the umbrella of the PNC and helped to really um, make sure by 1964 we were able to get, you know, the maximum political electoral um, turnout in the African community, which put the elections very closely and with a coalition with the United Force, the PNC was able to um, be more victorious. Uh, so, Koyan and Askria, in a real way, played a significant role in bringing the PNC into political office. And many people don't know, when after the election results, Burnham had a decision to make. Either could have gone to the to the United Force and to struck on a, a, a coalition a, a, a agreement with United Force, or there was a possibility the govern the govern the governor appointing him, <laughs> you know, a, a, as leader. And Burnham was inclined to go that way, and this Koyana's you know influence and steadfastness forced him to go the other way and to actually seek out a coalition with the United Force. Okay, let's talk about his black power. In 1961, he helped to form the African Society for Racial Equality, and in 1964, he also co-founded Ascria. Takuma, after developing a reputation as a Marxist in the 1950s, what drove Koyana in the direction of black nationalism? Um, you see, I think Koyana was a, a saw Marxism, Leninism as a, a tool for um, analysis and a tool to understand society. But he was also very creative and he didn't see no contradiction between pursuing quote-unquote Marxism and pursuing um, African nationalist um, interests. I don't know whether it is fair to say that he was a Marxist before he became an African nationalist, I don't. I'm not mm -hmm. too sure he will uh, he will accept that interpretation. But he, the, the important thing he didn't see Marxism as as as, as a, a contradiction to, to, to African nationalism. Okay, Esterine, do you want to? Um, well, what he said actually was that. He believed that the interests of Africans needed to be protected because if Jagan was going to, uh, um, like what he exp what, um, Mr. Gunsi explained, if Jagan was going to go with what the Indians were saying vis-a-vis -vis the Federation issue, then somebody needed to protect the interests of the blacks within the um, country. And so he felt that it was his, it was actually his duty to organize and to um, fight for the interests of blacks in the country because Jagan was organizing and fighting for the interests of the Indians. So somebody had to do it for the blacks, and he felt that he was in the position and he was the um, a fitting person to do such. Okay, Takuma, tell us about Ascria what it was about and the role that you see po played within the organization. But okay, ASCRIO was a cultural organization, but we define culture in a holistic way. You know, some people when they talk about culture, they don't think about singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. But for <laughs> ASCRIO, culture is a real life of a people. Therefore, our understanding of, of cultural matters also include political matters. And this is important because 
one of the problems we have with the, with the, with the political people, especially the, the PNC, you know, and so is that they would want you to be a cultural group that stick to singing and dancing. Mm. But when you the, see culture holistically and you decide that you have an equal responsibility, a cultural responsibility to engage a political system, it creates problems with the so-called con you know, conventional politicians. So, but so ASCRI was that kind of group. We promoted, uh, we, we contributed in a significant way to the re-awakening <coughs> African consciousness in the country. In the, we, in the 60s, we launched what we call the Cultural Revolution, where we encourage African changing to African names. Mm -hmm. We encourage African weddings, African naming ceremonies, um, wearing our African clothes. We also encourage students you know, <coughs> to even study Swahili, an African language. You know, so we, we, we as an organization at that time really worked hard in reawakening in the African community both um, dignity, respect for self, and a love for, 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 for African, um, things African. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I told you what we did at the political level. We also was instrumental in tying the African Guyanese struggle with the wider Caribbean struggle, North American struggle, and the struggle on the continent. We, 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 we were instrumental in bringing the Pan African <coughs> um, movement headquarters in Guyana, and the Pan African headquarters was in Guyana for, for quite a while. It only broke up eventually after the split between ourselves and the PNC. And uh, Askri and Koyana also played a significant role in promoting Burnham's image in the African liberation movement in the continent. And I think those are important roles, um, both culturally and politically, I think that Askri played in the period. Okay. And what would you say, both of you, is Koyana's lasting contribution in Guyana? Um. For me, I would say that he is known as a anti-corruption crusader and a political moralist, all right? Bringing that moral element into politics. I always remember some, um, I read it somewhere that, I can't remember exactly where now, but somebody asked him what was his price, you know? And he said, my price is the cleaning up of corruption. Right? So it shows that he was able to take a stance on, firm stance on whatever he believed and he stood by what he believed through whatever. If it meant having to break with a particular group or particular persons because they didn't stand for what he stood for, then that, that was it. Right? He, like I said, he, when he discovered that moral element in politics, it was something that he stood by and something that you would see throughout his um, his political career. All right? he, he stood for equality, he stood for fairness, and we can see that that is what he still stands for. Okay. Takuma? Yeah, I'm, I support everything the sister um, mentioned. I will just add this add that I think that um, one of the, the, the lasting legacies of, of UC um, Takayana my judgment, apart from the other things that we mentioned, is the fact that he brought, I would say, the dignity to African politics. He brought dignity to African politics and he helped to contribute to African uh, kind of non-racist element in African mm -hmm. politics, which helped to, in my mind, helped to um, and it, it's an ongoing phenomenon, but I think it contributes to even the present st status quo that we have in Gu Guyana because, you know, you can't separate what Ascria from the WP. You can't separate WP here <laughs> from Koyana. Mm -hmm. you, and, in a, in a, and in a real way, a lot of the the moral authority of the party develop. It develop, you know, 
through the Koyana influence. Even Walter, you know, understood that. Uh, Walter always said to us, if push come to shove, we have to save Koyana, <laughs> if nobody else. <laughs> because he felt that only Koyana could guarantee that the sacrifices that we, 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 we were prepared to make to move Guyana forward could be assured, you know. Only, he felt he only could trust it in Kwan, not even himself. And, and, and I really believe that the challenge that we have in a multi-ethnic society, okay, the African political leadership, okay, in the past we made mistakes. Okay, and any political leadership will make mistakes. Okay, but we have a, a duty to correct those mistakes. And I think that Koyana stands as a kind of, um, more than a symbol, a kind of moral pressure mm. on us to do things right. And I think even though many people don't want to admit it, I think, you know, and I think that will be his lasting le legacy. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the village movement. What was Kwayana's role in the village movement? Well, um, remember that he was a grassroots politician and he worked within his village, the village of Boxton, when they, um, for, for instance, in the early stages, when the um, plant, the villages near, the, the nearby villages would flood the, the Boxton village and Nobody wanted to do anything about it. Kwayana was able to organize with other villagers and for um, they had what they call the contention coca issue. I always <laughs> like the name, that name, <laughs> contention coca. And they didn't want to open the coca because um, the, the excuse was the coca door wasn't good and all sorts of things. And the village of Buxton was inundated. And he organized people in the village and they went and they removed the coca door so that the village could drain out and you know and um, get life back to some sort of order so he was very very instrumental in an early stage whatever problems the village of Buxton had by the 1950s Quayan was was um, involved in that along with people like Martin Stevenson they formed their own groups in um, in Buxton and they used those to sort of organize things, challenge the status quo, because it's, it's not a case where um, there weren't village representatives in Buxton. They were, but they were people who for a very long time were accustomed to doing things the old way. All right, remember sugar was king and they basically controlled whatever was happening. And he was able to overturn that to a certain extent, all right, challenging the status quo and actually being a representative for the people right because for a very long time those who were elected to represent the people didn't represent the people they were more interested in their positions they were more interested in their standings and the good relationship that they had with the those in authority he didn't have a he didn't mind irritating those in authority. He didn't mind. Once it was for the benefit of the people of Buxton, he did what he had to do for them. Okay. Tipuma, can you comment on Koyana's role in the village movement? Um, I think Koyano saw the village movement, you know, um, began in Guyana uh, many years ago. I think it started with the, the free Africans, slaves buying villages and so forth. I think Koyana saw in that historical unfolding um, situation a lot of possibilities for empowerment of, 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 vill of, the, of the villages and the ordinary people in the village and he he, he saw that the, the, the village movement okay creates a real possibility to bring a new generation of political activists in the political um, of free and I think that um, he felt more importantly too it offered good opportunity for the empowerment of the masses so he invested quite a lot of time in, you know in trying to strengthen the movement 
you know, encouraging young people, you know, to participate, encouraging the community, you know, to get involved and to strengthen the democratic currents and the possibilities within the, within villages. Um, and I think that that was very important. And it's 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 unfortunate that over time, you know, our villages and you know the, the, the level of village democracy and involvement that people had in those days and interest they paid into the village are, are matters. We saw a lot of that disappear in the 70s and, 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 and thereafter. And I think it's really unfortunate and we do have a ch challenge to revitalize um, the local democracy in the villages and so. Mm -hmm. okay. Kwayana, apart from being a political activist, is an educator, cultural activist, constitutional expert, and author. How is he able to weave all of that together? I, I think about <laughs> that and I wonder sometimes how, you know, because when I was doing my work on him, and every time, you, every time you turn, it's like something new he's doing or something new he did. And in all of that, he was pursuing his own education. It was like, how is he able to? But I think that um, his extreme discipline, this, this man was very, very disciplined, you know, and that um, accounted a lot for what he was able, for what he was able to do, the many hats that he was able to wear um, simultaneously, right? Because we can see from, um, from a very early age, I think it was the age of 21 he basically changed his entire lifestyle you know he changed his eating habits and all of those things and I think that th that discipline that he had and a good thing is that it wasn't something that was driven by external forces you know it was something that was in it something that was within him that he was able to use to i i don't know that's that's my <laughs> best explanation i really don't know how he was able to do it all and still remain sane because <laughs> i think that's the hardest that's the hardest of the questions to answer <laughs> i think you know i think we have to accept that some people are born genius yeah they're born with some talents that are extraordinary, and I think he's he has been gifted. Quran mm -hmm. will tell you he don't like public speaking, he don't like to speak, but he will tell you he likes to write. Yeah. You know, so and um, you know, so it seems to me that um, he was able to recognize very early where his his natural talent lies in writing and and the, and the creative instincts, and he was able to as the sister said, be very disciplined because even though you may have these things and you may recognize it, you still have to have the discipline to yeah. do the research and the work and to mm -hmm. do the and he was very organized and very disciplined person. But I must confess that is the hardest <laughs> question yes. to answer. Yes, you know, I don't know. Okay, let's talk about something that might be easier to talk about. Personal experiences with Kwayana. I know as Serene, when we spoke before about Kwayana, you told me that you had to um, seek his permission to write about him for your MA thesis. Mm -hmm. Tell us what it was like meeting UC Kriana. Oh my goodness. I I don't think I could really explain what it was like cuz to me Kriana is living history. You know, and um when he came for the the um water on inquiry, I was given the opportunity of meeting him and finally having the opportunity to talk because we were communicating for a couple of years well via uh, emails and things like that but to actually meet him it was it, it was something else man it was and to realize that in meeting him he is exactly the kind of person that you have been reading about and you know and communicate because you know some people you 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 talk to them and you're communicating with them but then when you meet them they are completely different but this man is the same he is he's just the same as um, he was in talking in communicating and, 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 uh, and, that. and I think I shared with you before when I first approached him about doing my work on him you know he wanted to know Who's your family? <laughs> What's your family background? What's your family's name? And all sorts of things where you went to school and you know. But then in the end it um it worked out. But meeting him was something else. He was and he's so soft spoken. 
you know, he was he it was it was extraordinary. That's that's as much as I can say. Okay, it was an extraordinary up. opportunity. Okay, tell us about your interaction with well, you, Sabrina. Many interactions, Korea. Uh, it's, it's so long, but um, let me see, let me let me see if I could start from the very early. Mm -hmm. um, I was a student in Christchurch School, and I'm Stokely Carmichael. I'm visit visited Guyana. Um, and he had a, a lecture at Plaza, which is not too far from our school in Camp Street. And a number of us, you know, students went over and we heard Stokely argue his version of Black Paul. And I remember th there were some Indian elements who challenged um, him and he, he dealt with the situation. And I think later I learned that one of the leading persons in, in, in that group that was ch trying to challenge um, him was Paul Tennessee. I learned that many years later. But he um, Stokely ended his, his, he all ended his speech. There will be no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. <laughs> A quotation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I remember all of this, many of us students run on, as you go to the place, there used to be repeating the thing, there's no revision to see, <laughs> the shedding of blood. I don't know whether at that time we really understood. fully understood, but somehow we, we clicked into it. And then uh, I had a, um, a friend named Godfrey Sage, who he was, he, he knew Askria more at that time, but I, didn't know, was, I wasn't conscious of Askria at, at, at that time. And he said, no, we should go and jo join Askria. And then eventually went over some point and we, we joined as Korea and, and during I, I came into contact with Koyana but to be honest at that time I was curious about his vegetarian um, <laughs> habit because I have had a when I was younger in, in, in um, primary school I had a serious um, kidney problem you know and I had to be, be treated for months I was in hospital and months in clinic and I always tell myself, you know, when I reach the age where I could determine what I eat, I want to become a vegetarian to save my kidneys. Mm. But I had no I had I, I had no life experience anybody who could say it is a vegetarian. Mm. So one of my thing was to meet this this Koyana who I hear is this vegetarian. I mean the Beth Koyana and I'm looking at you. I said, all right. You look good, you're very active. <laughs> I like to become a vegetarian. I do not do that. It's sort of my problem. <laughs> so that was very. Oh. Um, if, but that was very. Uh, and, and I'm a vegetarian you know, for over 40 something years. So, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, now, Koyana, one of the things that strike him about Koyana is his simplicity. Mm -hmm. You couldn't. You c once you make contact, you can't miss his simplicity. But within that, as you get to know him within that simplicity is also very formless he's a very firm and stubborn person once he 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 dig his, his feet in you know he, he, you know push over so it's not you know he's not a person who when it terms the strength he's a ton of strength you know um another important um a thing is the, the way in which he 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 he, he used fasting as a political weapon you know, and uh, many of us younger people, you know, and Koyan decided to go for the fast, and so we we we, we, we debate quietly whether we should join this <laughs> fast, whether this thing makes sense, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, those are some unique things about Koyan that you can't you, uh, you, you, you can't you can you can't miss about him. Um, another another thing as we go. He he, he at some point he became. What we call an honorable sistering. He embraced the sistering movement. And some of us, you know, have got to deal with Koyano and to deal with some of these contradictions with him, you know. You know, we, 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 we watch him, we watch him, and we some some we feel that, you know, if we get injustice here, he, 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 he swing him up on the sistering side. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I mean, uh, I tell, mention these lighter things to say that, you know, these are very important qualities, you know, yeah. because, you know, once Koyana embraced the sistering movement uh, as an important political matter, 
it put pressure upon everybody around him to deal with, to deal with it indirectly and directly. Mm -hmm. I think those are some of the, you know, the engagements that I, um, I, 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 I remember quite a lot. I also, um, you know, I used to be quiet almost a weekly basis, you know, so there's a lot of things <laughs> I understand about the person. But um, I also see as every human being, he also had his weaknesses. I think one of Kwayana's weakness, I I in my judgment, he, he tends to look, he will look at the positive side of people and try to ignore the negative side. And uh, some of us believe that that was a, that was a, a weakness because we believe that, you know, you lose some of your objectivity, you know. And, and I think he, he had a, that, that weakness. He invests too much in seeing the more positive side of human being, a human person. And, and I, I would say it was a, a, a weakness, and I, you know. I don't know whether you share <laughs> the, 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 the criticism or the observation, but, I, you know. Do you think that in 2015, with the changes that are happening in Guyana, for example, there's a coalition government, do you think that now in 2015, we are any closer, Guyana is any closer to Quiana's vision of what it should be? Um, one of the things that caused him to eventually have to leave the PNC was this whole idea of joint premiership or partition because he felt at that time that it was difficult for us to ask one race to be subject to the other so he wasn't asking any race to be subject to the other so he should have joint or equal um, premiership at that time which is um, pre which now would be translated into presidency so maybe this coalition is a smidgen of what he would have um, envisioned. At least there is some some sharing of um, power. It's not one winner take all, one party completely in control of everything. So maybe with this um, with this coalition government, you will see some of what he envisioned for um, for Guyana. Yes, I, I think that um, this coalition government brings us closer, you know, to Kwayana's vision. Um, I think Kwayana always wanted to see a united Guyana, mm -hmm. both racially and politically. I think that um, he also wanted to make sure that we resolve our political and ethnic differences in a nonviolent way. Mm -hmm. You see, his, when he and others argue for partition, they argue for partition or joint premiership, you know, partition or joint premiership are two things together. But the whole trust of the initiative was to avoid uh, the two races fighting because by that time it was clear that the Africans and Indians were on a collision course that will get only worse unless there's some political um, solution. And uh, you know, the, the two major leaders, both Burnham and Jaga, reject, rejected that. In fact, all mm -hmm. they preach is that Kwayana, you know, call for, for, for the racist, he want partition. Mm -hmm. And they say nothing about the, the joint premiership, premiership element mm -hmm. of the thing. But well, we saw subsequently, soon after, the country going to one of the worst racial um, sit, um, blood baths, you know. And that's what basically he was trying to avoid. I think that all revolutionaries and Marxists and non-Marxists, every revolutionary, accept that in a social process, the possibility that violence do play a role and may have a positive role. But I think Koyano reflecting, you know, on the experience in Africa and elsewhere over the, the years, I think as he got older, he became very firm in the belief that nonviolent political solutions are far more superior than violent political solutions. Mm -hmm. 
and Guyana was always on the path of how we gonna resolve our, our problems. Could we find a peaceful resolution of it or do we have to fight it out violently? And I think that the fact that we are able to bring both political change, okay, in a peaceful way, I think Koyana um, will feel that it's a very important um, forward movement for the country. And I think that, you know, it's more closer to his vision that Guyana could achieve more if we could find peaceful ways to resolve even the most difficult um, um, situations in the country. Okay, as we come to the close of the discussion on Quayana, final question, what is Quayana's legacy? I think, um, like I said, probably mentioned earlier, it would definitely have to be incorruptibility and um, morality in politics. That will be his lasting legacy because anybody who speaks about him, the first thing they're going to say is that this is a man that you couldn't bribe. This is a man that you couldn't get him to do anything on the hand. This is a man that was upright and had, mo um, had morals and he stood by those morals throughout. It didn't matter what the circumstances or the situations were. So I think that that will be his lasting legacy, that moral aspect of um, that he brought to politics because everybody when you think about po um, politicians the first words that come to your mind the person is a scam <laughs> they're tricksters they you know they, they say one thing and then they do something else all right but then when you when you speak about Koyano you will never ever associate him with any of those things okay yeah I, con I concur I think his legacy will be that he have demonstrated that human beings could um, succumb to these um, temptations, you know, and, and I think that um, his incorruptibility, his sense of fairness, his se his unselfishness, because you know, Koyana, you know, have you know really contributed his life to what he believed. Mm -hmm. You know, it affects his family and so forth. But he really give everything, you know, to. He, his political um, um, convictions and I think that those are going to be um, you know some of the last um, legacies um, I don't think we're going to throw up in the, 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 the foreseen future another Koyano mm -hmm. I don't think so so he, it's he, you know these these personalities like it's one in, in one on far you know, one and far. Uh, but I think he leave a lot of footprints that younger people, you know, could step into and try to build. Okay. We've come to the end of our program. Thank you, Miss Adams and mm -hmm. Mr. Ogunsi for being on African Drums, for sharing with me and our viewers about UC Kriana, his life, his work, and his legacy. Mm -hmm. okay. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you viewers for staying with us. This has been African Drums, the television organ of the Coffee 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and the encouragement of self-activity. Please like our Facebook page, it's Coffee 250. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Coffee 250, for videos of the show. Send us an email, we'd love to hear from you, and donate to the cause. It's coffee250gy at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. I am Elsie Harry. Please join us next time.